Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Uh, my name is Mike Davis. My guest today is Mike Davis, Riley Sager, and uh, we've got Pete Rollick and Matthew Carpenter with us for now. Might have some other panelists later. Hey, Riley, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Thank you for uh, thanks for joining us. Um, no problem. I know you just got about a half an hour, so we'll do our introductions real quick. For It's especially handy for those listening later or if it's their first time listening. So, um, hey, Rick, there you are. You want to introduce yourself, buddy? Rick Lay, uh, writer and Pope magazine collector. And, and Matt, and you have a prize as usual. Yes. Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. The prize is a hardcover copy of A Black and Endless Sky by Matthew Lyons. If you want to win it, you send an email to ezineprizes at gmail.com, put black in the subject heading. We'll draw a winner in about six weeks. So you have some time to get an entry in and who knows, you might win this book. Pete Rowley. What? How the hell what are you? Are you? How the hell are you? I'm, you know what? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I can't complain. You know, but my you wife do. and kids have been gone for five days. They're coming back tonight, um, living the bachelor life, which means doing a lot of work around the house, the honey-do list. You know, depending on how long, I'm going to be in Tallahassee for Christmas. So depending on how long I'm there, I may get the time to drive down to see you. And I expect a really good meal. I, yes. Okay. Or I could simply make arrangements to um, take Christmas with my mother-in-law in Tallahassee that's even and, better you know that way you don't have to drop that's even better because I'll have limited time anyway uh being the professional that I am I'm going to focus on the guest for now um <laughs> hey Riley um for those I you know uh you've sold a lot of books you're you're very well known um congratulations and and well deserved from the books of yours that I've read um well, thank you really enjoyed them um for those who don't know you can you can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself yeah um i'm riley sager which i think most people know is not my real name <laughs> it's a pen name um and uh riley is the author of six no six my god i keep losing track it's, this has been like that many of of six books six um, books i got your and, website up yeah yeah, five of them have been New York Times bestsellers. Um, the most recent one is The House Across the Lake, which came out in June. And my previous one, Survive the Night, the paperback comes out at the end of August. And yeah, it's it's been a pretty crazy trip. It's been like five years since my first one, Final Girls, came out. And it's been kind of a rocket ride since then. Um. Yeah, that is that is kind of a crazy ride because, uh, you know, a lot of writers they they write for years and years and years until they're discovered, maybe hit that that kind of point. Um, did you write before then? Did you publish books? Like, I have a friend named Paul Trembley. He wrote several. Who's awesome? <laughs> oh, you know Paul? Yes, I love his book. Yeah, he's he scares me. Yes, his book is <laughs> Paul scares you. Like a head full of ghosts was just like truly one of the most frightening things I've ever read. So, well, oh, for those of you, since we brought up Paul, Paul emailed me today and told me that he tested negative for COVID. Now he's had COVID for the last week. So, got back from Spain, tested positive for COVID, and had to sequester to his bedroom for a week or so. I guess. Yeah. Well, that's uh, good news. He's 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 back, and every pretty much everyone I know who's gone somewhere in the past month has like come back with COVID, and it's like don't go on vacation. Yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, I, I bring up Paul as an example because he wrote he wrote several books that um uh what was it, the Big Sleep and several others like that um that received attention, but not the kind of attention he's he's getting now. What about you was were these your first books these six books no i mean i i wrote under my real name i had a uh, three books that was um like a small town mystery series but 
they were a little bit more gruesome than I think the normal small town mystery series is. <laughs> and maybe that's why they didn't sell at all, but they didn't sell like at all. And so I was sort of at a really big career crossroads. I was in newspapers for many, many years. And um, the time my publisher was kind of like, yeah, we're kind of done with you was the same time my newspaper that I worked at was also like, yeah, we're also kind of done with you. <laughs> so <laughs> we're both like, done okay, with you. I've, I have no job. I have no publisher. I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life now. Um, what the heck do I do? And so it was. Um, it was Halloween of 2014. I remember it well. And I was watching the movie Halloween as one does. Of course. And I got the idea for the book that would later become Final Girls. And so like I wrote it, my editor, my agent was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, you're gonna need to release it under a pen name. I was like, but why? And she, you know, publishing is so weird. It is. And publishing, they're th- like, they love the hot new thing. And what they don't love is someone who's written three books that didn't sell at all. And so she was like, you know, for the best chance you have of this book succeeding is to use a pen name. And so that's what we did. And um, the book, there were several publishers involved who wanted it. Um, I chose Dutton Books because they struck me as being incredible. And then six months before the book came out, um, it was the day after Christmas, a little known writer named Stephen King tweeted (laughs) that it was going to be like the next big thriller. Yeah, he's got a little bit of influence. If he if he Just keeps tag, it, yeah. if he keeps it up, he'll do well, I think. And so that kind of changed that it changed my life. Like a tweet from him literally changed the trajectory of my career. And so it's been speaking really of Paul, of- I think Paul would have been still successful without it. But that something very similar happened to Paul. Yeah, it it, it there there's like a little club of us where like we've all been kind of lucky enough to be mentioned by uncle stevie and um get kind of his blessing on social media and then it just changes things overnight it's crazy sean hamill sorry sean hamill yes sean our, our yes sean um cj tudor is another one she does great in the uk yeah there's been you know speaking of how weird publishing is riley i um i've noticed and i've talked about this with pete um that let's take Stephen King is an example. A blurb from Stephen King is a great thing to have. But a tweet from Stephen King does far more than a blurb. For example, if you got a blurb on the front of your book, Stephen King saying, I love this book, people are going to pay attention to that, okay? They're browsing in the bookstore and they're going to be like, oh, well, it must be good then. But it just seems like a tweet does so much more. Social media, his social media does so much more than even just a blurb without the social media. So yeah, because kind of it, it, it because I think with blurbs, some people kind of take them with a grain of salt, like, okay, they're just saying this to be polite, or you know, like the whole the whole blurb ecosystem in publishing is so weird. And um a tweet from him means like he wasn't forced to do it, he just did it because he thought it was a really right. good read. And it brought he was so excited. Much that's what what's what it means, yeah. Yeah, he, that he was excited enough to like pick up his phone and be and tweet about it. And other people then take notice so like for me a week later final girls was in entertainment weekly back when they still did print editions like they had the cover there and like everything and this was months before the book came out and like me and my publishing team we were just like is this really happening like pinch me is this like because like you can't buy that kind of publicity Mm -hmm. and it was just it was crazy well, congratulations! And I'm completely in that man's debt for the rest of my life, and and it sort of kicked off that whole. There were a whole series of final girl tie-ins, not tie-ins to your book, but right. You know, it sort of kicked off that whole. There were a couple movies. There were a couple other, uh, you know, books. But Some Riley you, did it first, right? You, you kind of kicked off well, this. <laughs> no, but the, the idea is no, out I, there. I, it, I think I came along at like a, at, at a, a good time to remind yeah. people that like, hey, Final Girls exist and they're awesome. Yeah, it's such a fun idea, you know, such an interesting idea to take 
final girl characters and you know create a story from there yeah and, and to see like for me it was like what happens like 10 years after the slasher flick like what how how messed up are they because you know th- they have to be messed up yeah you know, the, all and, the movies end with like sydney prescott or laurie strode yeah. being like we did it we vanquished ghostface or michael myers and then it's like okay now you have like decades of trauma ahead of you right especially because they keep making sequels yeah it's like in the yeah. latest scream movie the trailer uh what's his name says to sydney you have a gun she goes i'm sydney prescott of course i have a, da- a gun i love that line yes <laughs> or is it the second or third movie where she's in a cabin surrounded by with, with killer dogs and oh yeah electrified fences and yeah and she's working from home before everybody worked from home <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes, yes. And she's a she's a crisis counselor right <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Final Girls, um, wonderful book. Your latest book is The House Across the Lake. So let's focus on that for a minute. Obviously, um, that's where you'd like to focus and, and let people know that it's it's now out there. If you're a Riley Fager Sand, Riley Sager Sand, sorry, um, then hey, pick this book up. Tell the audience what is The House Across the Lake about? Spoiler free. Um, yes, yeah, spoiler free. This, this this is a really hard book to talk about. Because yeah. like it is, it's it's rear window on a lake. Mm-hmm. Is is basically yeah. I was the I'm there with that concept right there. The the idea that popped in my head, and and this was like it was not going to be my next book. I had a different book in mind, and then um, in October 2020, when the pandemic just shot all vacation plans to hell, um, just to get out of this house and go somewhere, like we rented a lake house for a week in Vermont. And the first night there, I mean, it has this, has this gorgeous porch like that like sits right on the water and there are these rocking chairs. So like I poured myself a bourbon, went out to the porch, sat down in the rocking chair and um, looked at the houses on the other side of the lake. And there was like this one house that was really neat and it was all lit up. And I just instinctively like leaned forward and was like, who lives there? And what is their oh. life like? And have they murdered someone? And what dark secrets are they hiding? And it just struck me as like a perfect location for a rear window type story. I've done that on a lake and other places too. Like there's people there, but to you, it's this, basically it's this, it's this, this basically a light in a window. Or yeah. Two. And there, that's it. And there's something so fascinating about it. Like not in a, in a pervy way, but just in a, like a no, curiosity yeah. way where you see a lit window and you just instantly like look at it and be like, okay, what's going in there? Like just, just out of curiosity. And so I tried to tap into that with the book. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, so ahead, Rear Window is, is one of my favorite films. And I'm also a big fan of, of the spinoffs, Road Games, Disturbia. Um, I like uh, the woman on a train. Is it woman on a train, girl on a train? The girl on the train and the woman in the window. Yeah, yeah. both excellent. The yeah. girl on the train I like because it sort of subverts your your expectations. You're, you're expecting that, oh, she's going to be the hero. And really, she's a drunk. You, you, it, you, it, it flips your expectations. on it. But I see some of that in in this book. Oh, yeah, where, yeah. Like, it was... You, yeah. I was purposely, like, leaning into the... Because this is where it gets hard to, like, talk about, like, there's some twistiness to this book and so like, right. things aren't quite what they seem but nobody's we... c- completely reliable here yes you're right and and so like i wanted to like really lean into because i know that like most readers are savvy and so like they've seen these movies and they've read these books and they kind of know what to expect and so like my goal was like okay i'm going to give you exactly what you expect and more in spades like all the cliches and tropes i could think of like i kind of threw in there and then it was fun and then just like okay and now pull the rug out from other them and just blow like the whole concept up are you familiar with the fairly new book just came out last year called the dictionary of obscure sorrows riley no i'm not Um, that title's awesome it is an awesome title and it's basically uh it's by a fellow by the name of john koenig and I'll, I'll I'll make it clear why I bring this up in just a second. Um, he basically makes up beautiful words for 
feelings that we all have that really don't have words for them. Uh, one of his most popular ones is called Sonder, S-O-N-D-E-R. And this relates to what you were talking about, about seeing the light, the house across the lake, and wondering about that person. Uh, Sonder is, and I'm reading from the book now, uh, the realization that each random, random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited craziness. An epic story that continues invisibly around you like an anthill sprawling deep underground with elaborate passageways to thousands of other lives that you'll never know existed, in which you might appear only once as an extra sipping coffee in the background, as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, or as a lighted window at dusk. So I, I love this book, and I thought of Saunders as soon as you were talking about that. And yeah, no, it's it's not a it's not a it's not a pervy wonder what they're about. It's more like a they're another human like me. I wonder what their life's like. Right. Yeah. And that's that was an amazing description. And it like captures like that feeling perfectly of just to it's it's kind of being it's like people watching in a way like mm -hmm. i love people watching because you see these people and you know that like they have a whole lifetime of experience and all these stories and all this things and you just want to be like tell me everything yeah did you ever so we used to do that we used to people watch as kids but then we used to make up stories for them that's what rally's doing that's, that's kind of what i did with this one yeah. <laughs> But yeah, we 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 sitting at the train station or in the airport. It's like, oh, that guy's a spy, and that woman with him, she's not his wife. She's her his handler, but she's secretly a, a dominatrix, and you know, just you just keep spinning it. <laughs> yeah, I had off. to go there, uh, Pete. You ever read that Bradbury story where the guy gets off on a train just randomly in this small town in the middle of nowhere? Yeah. There's a, yeah, which Brad, which Brad? Uh, no, 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 no. no. That, that, there's only one like this. Okay. And he meets a, a guy that's sitting in the train station, but it's, I'll ruin it if I continue, yeah. but it has to do with what we're talking about. Um, You know, rear window on a lake, first of all, that just sells it for me. And I think a lot of people right there, uh, Riley. So, yeah, because I mean, one rear window is, there are a few perfect movies Rear Window is one of them. I love that movie. It is my favorite movie of all time. I'm a big horror guy, but Rear Window is my favorite movie. Um, and every time I watch it, I learn something new. Yeah, and it's it. I think it's because it, it's it's almost it's about like almost going to the movies. Like it is. It's like there's a reason. Like his big picture window, like is the same shape as a movie screen. Like right. it's. it's it's a great, great movie. The the a couple of years ago, I watched it with my daughter, and she was like, "Oh, this film takes place in four days." I'm like, "How do you know that?" She's like, "The physical therapist. She has four uh, costume changes." Oh, I'm like that's... son of a. <laughs> bitch. She's a better Pete Rollick than Pete Rollick is. Yeah, yeah, but you know. I never even thought I'm not a big costume guy, but you know, pe people are, and stuff like that sends you stuff. It tells you. Really, it seems like uh, your six books, um, they have a lot of them, if not all of them, have to do with, you know, events. Uh, maybe not the house across the lake so much as as the others, but events that happened a while ago that people are dealing with now. Like Final Girls is a good example. And then I've not read the last time I I lied yet. I, I look forward to doing it. But, but it's, yeah, it's the same deal. <laughs> yeah, it, lo it looks like a you know basically. Uh, what are the camp movies? Sorry, I just uh, the the horror movies at a camp. I forget the titles. This is this is more picnic at Hanging Rock. Oh, yeah. There's I'm there's no more there's no mass slasher. There's just missing girls. Oh, I'm even more sold now. Were you thinking Friday the 13th? I was, yes. Thank you. Um, tell us, uh, I, I read um, one of the things that drew me to, um, I believe this was your previous book, Survive the Night. Is, is that right? That was your last book? Yes, Survive the Night was my last one, yeah. Uh, the three words that 
got me reading this book was it's November 1991. And right away I was like, oh, I, I hope this is good. And it was uh, because, you know, you have no cell phones, you know, you have no way of calling for help. Uh, you don't have all those tools that I'm glad we have today, but that don't work very well sometimes in a horror movie or a horror book. Um, I do, you know, you got that cliche, boring question to ask a writer, where do you get your ideas? But maybe a more interesting question is, you told us how, what the genesis was uh, for the house across the lake. What about survive the night? What, what started you going down that path and thinking, I want to write a book about this. And, and what is that yeah. book about? If you want to tell the audience. Um, it, the, the, the summary is a girl, a killer a car. It's, it's a college student. It's 1991. Right. A college student needs to get home and um, she meets a guy at the ride board, which is a thing that used to happen on college campuses. And um, where it was like college sanctioned hitchhiking, basically. And she, the reason she needs to get home is because her roommate was murdered by a man known as the campus killer. And he's still at large. And so they get in the car and no sooner do they hit the highway than she starts to think that, you know, he's not who he says he is and that she might actually be in the car with the campus killer. And most of the book is two people in a car suspecting each other of things. And the idea really came from, I wanted to do something really kind of short and insulated. Like I really wanted to challenge myself. We talk about rear window, like, I think there's maybe one shot in that yeah. whole movie that takes yeah. place outside of that apartment. And so I wanted to do kind of a similar thing. We're like, okay, let's put two people in a car and see how much tension I can wring from that and see how long I can keep it going before they inevitably get out of that car. And so it was a little, little bit of a challenge to myself, a fun challenge. Uh, but go ahead, I'm with sorry. cell phones, like, it would have ruined everything. The yes. book would not exist. It would be over after five pages. So that's why I said it in 1991, because it was just right before the internet and right before cell phones became like a, a almost common thing. And so she was at the mercy of, you know, pay phones that usually don't work and the kindness of strangers. Yeah. In her own ways. Uh, I believe she also is a real movie buff as well she loves she's loves a movies. huge movie buff yeah I, I call survive the night like a, a a love letter to movies disguised as a thriller it would also be a challenge to a filmmaker because there's really some easy ways if you're going to adapt this into a film to do it wrong you have to keep that tension as you did in the book yes there is an intrepid screenwriter who's trying to do it and i wish him luck <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Road Games with Stacey Keach and Jamie Lee Curtis? No, I've, I haven't. I, but I, I've seen Duel, and Duel was like sort of my what I, I aspired to when I wrote it because Duel was a, is an amazing movie. So Road Games, uh, Stacey Keach is a trucker driving across the outback. He picks up Jamie Lee Curtis, who's hitchhiking, and they just like in the fog. Yep. Just like in the fog, they play a game because they're bored and there's only a few other cars on the road. And they think that the guy in the van that's driving with, with them or near them is a serial killer. Now I, I, I need to see this movie now. And he stops every, every time they stop, he stops somewhere nearby and he spends the night digging. Oh, I gotta watch and this. Then, and Here's the here's the kicker. He's hog, he's hauling pigs. That is such Car a great way to get rid of bodies. He's holding he's hauling pig carcasses for market. That's so. Like, when was it, it made? It's in the eighties. It is an homage to Rear Window because it all takes place in the cabin of the of the vehicle. Um, hmm. there's a few scenes that are shot outside. Uh, you know truck stops and whatnot but it is basically just two people convincing themselves that there's a serial killer well we know what riley's doing tonight i um, guess exactly <laughs> i'm i'm shocked that i did not know that this movie yeah, existed it, that's crazy yeah. thank you you're welcome and it's it is written the, the director has admitted that it's written as an homage to rear window I, I, 
there's nothing wrong with an homage. Homage is nope, great. Nothing wrong at all with an homage for a window. <laughs> no, bring it oh, on. And there's a dingo. There's a dingo in the cap. Which a dingo is- ate my baby. Yep. <laughs> so November 1991, just real quick, uh, right about this time, I'm 20 years old at, in November 91. So I'm, I'm living in Fort Worth. I go visit some friends in Galveston, which is quite a drive. Uh, I don't know, maybe six, seven hours. I don't remember. But of course, yeah, no, no cell phone. This crappy car that I borrowed from my roommate. And I drive all night because it's going to be cooler, you know. It's Texas. And, or at least that was the plan. About halfway through, I'm in the middle of freaking nowhere. I mean, nowhere. Two lane. And the car just stops. I don't know what's wrong with it. And all I know is that I'm out in the middle of nowhere, in the dark, and I passed a gas station with a payphone about three miles back. So, I mean, what do you do? You can't pull out your cell phone. All you can do is let's start walking, I guess, you know. So she's in that she's in that boat and survived the night. You know, she's got no one to, to turn to. Yeah, I had to do that myself. I was I was a senior in high school in November 1991, and I did hit my car broke down and I didn't have to walk three miles, but I did have to walk to the nearest house knock on a stranger's door at 11 p.m. and be like, hi, can I use your phone, complete stranger? And they, you know, they let me in and I got to use their phone and call my dad. And like, there's like a trust back then that doesn't exist now today. And it's a trust on both sides because you don't know if they're crazy people. They don't know if you're a nut. Oh, yeah. I mean, they'd be like, yes, Riley, um, why don't you wait down in the basement? Uh, don't yes. mind all the chains down there. Um, we've got a phone down there. So. Please make yourself a home in our lovely padded basement. <laughs> there are th- that I was just thinking that there are so many movies that now play off of both ends of that trope. There are the crazy people that knock on your door and ask for help. And then there are the people who are re- legitimately in need of help and knock on the door and that is the wrong door to knock on. Uh, and both of those are just done to death these days. Yeah. But, uh, and probably as in really bad films. So to take it and make it new and interesting is really fun. Yes, and Matt's right. The picture in the house is the perfect example by H.P. Lovecraft. Of you've, not, you've gone into the wrong house for help. So I, I've read three of your books, Riley, including, of course, the new one, The House Across the Lake, that your publicists were, were kind enough to send me a copy. Um, what One thing, one that I've not read that I think I will tackle next is Lock Every Door. Uh, it just reading the description, it seems like one of those, I don't even know if it happens enough to call it a trope, but it happens kind of a microcosm in an apartment complex. Am I reading this right? Yeah, it's it's um uh, uh, a girl who um she is broke. She's pretty much homeless. She's living on her friend's couch. Um, gets a job as an apartment sitter at a mysterious, luxurious, glamorous New York institution called the Bartholomew, which um, may or may not be inspired by the Dakota, and um. She, you know, meets a fellow apartment sitter who suddenly disappears. And so she starts to suspect her neighbors of some maybe sinister goings on. And so she investigates. And it was so much fun to write because I I love that idea, like a young innocent going to an apartment building and maybe not everyone there has the best of intentions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's next for you if next, that you can talk I'm, about? I really can't say much. It's I can say that it takes place in 1983, again, because of the technology problem, mm-hmm. where I wanted it to be as far away from cell phones as possible. Um, and uh, I'm. it's due on my editor's desk <laughs> on September 6th, and so I'm writing as fast as I can. There better be a Commodore 64 in there, Riley. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a question before you go. Yeah. Uh, have you had any uh, contact like to translate your work into other media? Like today's the Netflix era. Or has anyone reached out through your agent? 
everything except um, Survive the Night has been optioned and was or is in some stage of development, including the house across the lake, which I can't say anything about yet, but I'm super excited about where that one might happen. Like what could happen with that one? But um, yeah, there's there's been lots of interest. Nothing has been made into a movie or a TV show, but um, it would be cool if it did. And if it doesn't, I'm okay with that too, because, you know, for me, like the book is enough, you know? Yeah. What do they say in publishing? It's no, 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 until you get a yes. And in adapting your, your books, it's from Hollywood. It's yes, 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 yes. To you get a no. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and like, you know, I said earlier, publishing is weird. Yeah. Hollywood from my experience is just so much weirder. And so, uh, yeah. I'm not in that position, but I have I have friends who are, and it just seems like you can't get your hopes up no matter what you hear. I mean, Tom Cruise could call you up and say, "Hey, we're you know we want to do this movie, and uh, let's start filming next month." And really, the right reaction is like, "Awesome! I hope to see, you know I'm excited about <laughs> it." And then and then in your own mind, think it may happen, it may not happen. <laughs> That's that's my my go-to now is just be like I'm I'm flattered, sure you want to do this, that's great, you know. All the best. I'm here if you have any questions. No one has ever asked me a question. And then I just kind of like let it go and be like, and that will probably never happen. So I can be surprised if it ever does happen. Exactly. You know, it's and I find it interesting that uh all six, all five of your books have been optioned, and the one that hasn't is the one that we talked about that could be challenging. It was challenging for you as a writer, a challenge you wanted to take on, and for a filmmaker, which is survive the night in the car, right? You know, so I don't know if filmmakers looking at that going, how the hell am I going to make that work? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so. I, I think so. Like they just were like logistically, nope, we don't want to even go near that one, and it's fine. You know, let's. I I think it's a it's a fun little book and I'm proud of it. Like I'm proud of all of my books. So that's, that's nice to like, not only have, yeah. you know, six books and that they sold well, but to also like at the end of the day, be like, yeah, I'm proud of those. Well, I know you got to go. I appreciate you coming by. Um, I hope you will again sometime. Definitely. Um, is there anything else that I've, I've forgotten that we've forgotten to ask that you'd like to get out there to the public um, or. No, readers. I think you covered you cover the basis. And yeah, thanks for having me. This was great. Oh, no problem. Uh, well, best of luck to you. I, The books of yours that I've read, I've loved, and I will uh, get to all six for too long. So thank you very much. <laughs> thanks a lot. Have a good one. Nice seeing you all. Bye. Bye. So... And Which, then there were four. And then there were four. What should we talk about? What well, we I want to mention about? a couple of books. All right. Um, okay, so this first one I'm just showing off. Um, this is the new Centipede Press edition of The Cipher. Wow, you really are showing off. Let me see the front. It's it's gorgeous. Oh, it's, my God. Uh, and it's, got, it's illustrated. It's a lovely... If you don't know... Um, this was an expansion of Kat Koja's uh, short story, Fun Hole. It is not mythos, but boy, is it Lovecraftian. Um, but the other book is, this is just, a, I picked this up because I pick all of this crap up. Uh, it's called um, The Legacy of the Unborn. I'm only about, I don't know, a, a fifth of the way into it. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. I have that in my to be read pile. Who's who it, wrote it's, that? It's, uh, the author's name is Silas K. Henderson. I don't All know right. who he is. Don't know him from Adam, but it's supposedly a sequel to it, The Mountains of Madness. Yes. But uh, it, it sort of doesn't matter. What you're following is a plucky reporter who's searching through a case and a doctor whose friend has disappeared. And you get alternating accounts between his journal and her working notes. And so the 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 plucky reporter is a is a woman. Yes. Why why are 
when you describe someone as plucky, why is it always only a woman? You never describe hear a man this, described this as plucky. This is written like set in the 1930s or something. It's like, and so this woman had to be really plucky to go into that reporter's den full of guys and cigarette smoke and clacking typewriters and show her stuff. But it, it's, I, I'm not saying this is like great, but it's it's really nice to have someone who's just sort of focusing on let's let's let me put down a mystery and then I'm gonna put it at a good pace. Uh, so I'm really actually oh definitely. Uh, like it may turn out to uh, be a bust later, but right now uh, I can't wait till we're done so I can go back to reading my book. That's awesome, Matt. Is there a can't third book? Is there a third book? I have um, some books. Uh, oh, I, uh, yeah, here, this is weird. This just came in the mail. It's like, there, there is no limit to like, uh, okay. So I had a history teacher once say, that you're plucky. Uh, you will use up the, um, subject of Lincoln, but you will never use up the subject of Lincoln and uh, and it's kind of like you may write all you want about Cthulhu, but Cthulhu and the Three Musketeers. Oh, or something. God. <laughs> the Musketeers versus Cthulhu in the court of King Louis. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. You might TBR know, pile. I don't know anything about it. I just picked it up and I thought, <laughs> okay, I may have to rewatch the. 1973 74 versions with Raquel Welch, Oliver Reed, and Michael York, the best Musketeer movies ever. Uh, if you need an excuse to do that, sure. Right. All right. That way I don't have to read the book. Speaking of TBR, as everyone knows now, I think uh, I do a list of TBR books with every podcast to put them in the show notes with links. Okay, so I'll mention a couple. You guys listening and watching can look at the rest. Uh, I don't know how long this $1.99 deal is going to last. This is July 31st, 2022. But Robert McCammon, The Border. Have you guys read this? I did not even heard of it. Uh, it's $1.99 on Kindle. It happened one day in April. Huge explosions in the skies across the world her heralded the coming of the Gorgon ships, sparking a worldwide panic. Indestructible, they blasted Earth's greatest cities into, ru into rubble. Then through portals opening in the air came the skeletal ciphers, and Earth became a battlefield in a war between two alien races built on mutual destruction. And I won't read the whole thing, but it looks really interesting. And it, hey, it's Robert McCammon, so you can't go wrong. Uh, I also have linked Corpse Mouth by John Langan. Really need to read that. I'm reading a book called, it just went away, The Problems of Philosophy and, come on, what do you mean this site can't be reached? <laughs> yeah. Oh, here it is, Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy by David J. Chalmers. Um, this is a really interesting book. Um, finally did come up. Uh, talks about what is reality. Um, and of course we've had a lot of books like that, but one of the more interesting points that he makes is that virtual worlds are just as real as quote unquote, the real world. Um, and I'm not going to do it justice. So I'm not going to attempt to explain his argument. Uh, but I'm about five chapters in and it's, it's very readable very good book it's a, it's a book about in many ways about the intersection between technology virtual worlds and philosophy so if that sort of thing interests you pick it up and again i've got the link in there um reluctant immortals by gwendolyn keist in there and a halloween in glarus by nick bodick um that's actually on kindle unlimited Again, I've got it linked, and a small collection of short stories that all take place in the days and weeks leading up to October 31st, culminating in a town called Glarus, where all the residents, as well as a few unwilling guests, 
take part in a strange ritual. So, there's my list. Um, Pete. Okay, so we've got an Economicon coming up in about three uh, weeks. Mike, I got some books. Yes, please, Rick. Go oh, ahead. Yes, yeah, Rick. Um, remember those psycho books that all came yes. out? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Did another one come out? A new, a new one came out. The Yig Cycle, published by Ramble House. It, Ramble House might be a, just a vehicle for price. I'm not sure. Did it come out as a real book or just a? It uh, was. It came out on uh, Kindle. Okay. I don't know if it's. It was supposed to be eventually published in uh, soft cover or hard cover, but I have the Kindle edition. All right. I actually have not been pleased with uh, the last couple cycle books Price released on his own. It's like he's unfettered from any restraint. Uh, you know, that uh, one he wrote about the secret Asia's blackest heart or something. This really? one, he, he, he wasn't bad. He didn't do anything excessive. Probably because he wrote most of the introductions in the, in the 80s. Aha. Uh because -huh. this was one of the original uh, Chaosium announced books. Yeah, I see that. Looking at the author list, it's the old crowd is uh, Stanley Sargent, uh, Lynn Carter, Brian McNaughton, Don Burleson, Peter Cannon, Adam Niswander, Don Webb, Walter DeBill. You know, those are like really solid 1970s names. <laughs> you get a lot of uh, obscure mental stories that I originally read in the past. He Adam this wonder I'm a second. Did you read it yet, Rick? Yeah, I've read most of it. What do you think? It was pretty good. I'll have to get it when it's in paperback. Uh, the other book was uh, mentioned by Paul Tremley, and uh, that was Matt Johnson's Pym, which was a sequel to Arthur Gordon Pym involving the um, racial angles of the story. Hmm. And I had been unaware that that book had recently come out. I think it came out a year ago. Okay. And it's, it is the most logical um, sequel to Poe's original book that I've read so far. All right. Any others, uh, Rick? No, that's it for now. Pete, you got any, or I think we want to talk a little bit about Necronomicon. Let's talk about Necronomicon. And you mentioned talking about the guests. Should we talk about the guests first, or should we talk about the programming? I've got the well, programming in front of me. Well, I, I do want to mention something to the listeners who are going to catch this in the next weeks before the convention. Yeah, I'm going to try to have the audio of this up this week. So. so first of all, there is a convention policy now that all venues, you have to have a map. Um, now, I think when we did the uh, film festival, we were also wearing masks. Mm -hmm. You were allowed to sit in your uh, chair in the theater and pull down your mask to eat or drink, but that was it. And it didn't really interfere with anything. Mm -hmm. So please, I would hope if you're kind of interested in going, don't let this policy bother you. And uh, I think they're going to be, it's the kind of thing where they're going to have masks available if you didn't have one. Yeah. Look, I, I, I've not read anything about, because they're going to be masking, they've not put anything out that I've seen about bringing your COVID vaccination status. But my suggestion also is take a photograph of your vaccine card on your phone so you can get to it very easily if you have to. Um, look, it's easy to bitch about this, but Niels is er erring on the side of keeping everybody safe. I, I agree. I am slightly claustrophobic. Let me be clear. I fucking hate masks. I hate them. So that said, I agree with his decision to require masks. Um, you know, Paul came back from Spain with COVID. Uh, he emailed me today, let me know that he's he's tested negative now 
but my point there is is that a few more people have been getting COVID lately. There's been a spike. And this is a perfect recipe. A bunch of people, a friendly, friendly group of people. Um, you know, one get person has COVID without masks. A lot of per people can get COVID. So, you know, I seriously doubt, as you said, Matt, that he's requiring, um, you know, your vaccination cards. And I doubt that he would. And, uh, but masks, yeah, I, I think it's reasonable. I know that people who do panels, uh, they can space themselves off from each other and take off their masks during the panels and so forth. So I know it's, it's reasonable. Now, all of that said, in the, the show notes, if you're going to have to wear a mask, let's make it fun. And do me a favor, do us a favor, and spread the word about the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. So in the show notes, I've got links to Lovecraft Easing Podcast masks. And if you order it now, you can get it in seven or eight days, depending on your, your uh, you know, the delivery time that you request. And I, you know, honestly, I would love to see a bunch of people wearing Lovecraft Easing podcast masks and Lovecraft Easing podcast t-shirts just to show their support. We only get one opportunity. I usually don't you go use car salesmen on this, but we only get one opportunity to spread the word in such kind of a unique way. You know what I mean? And there's something really powerful. We did this one year about a bunch of people wearing Lovecraft Easing t-shirts and masks. So I've got all those links in the show notes. You don't even have to search for them, and they're pretty cheap. So um, I, may, can, I, I, please consider it. To follow on, the you mentioned that the panelists will be sitting far apart. I, I believe that is the case. Not far apart, but they'll be spacing. But what this also means is they cut down the number of gaming slots. Mm, yeah. because they don't want people sitting next to each other like instead of having eight at a table you may have four or five and right now the gaming program is available if you don't know how if you've never been before what you do is you go to the gaming website you buy a, a pass for two dollars and then you can sign up for as many games as you want for free if the slots are available now, of course, like just for example, suppose Adam Scott Glantz, who are running a Call of Cthulhu scenario with Delta Green, well, that would book really quick. Uh, if you wish to run a game, I'm sure you can contact the convention. They could put you up there, but you better put in your requests now so that you can at least get some of the game slots that you want. Right. Yeah. M Matt, there's also apparently in this, I'm not clear about everything here but there's a concurrent online only gaming associated with this uh I, because i'm not going to be online i you didn't look didn't, into it didn't even look into it i i personally signed up for two things uh one is a larp called the red scare set around the i guess the 50s uh last year last convention the same group did a king in yellow larp that was a lot of fun uh, and the other one I signed up for was a D&D &D scenario for third level characters. You know, Neil's um, Neil's told me that he wants to get on here sometime in the next week or two to talk about any unquestion unanswered questions that we have about Necronomicon. I know he's extremely busy. It's been hard to get, you know, 20 minutes out of him, but I know that he wants to do it. Uh, if you, uh, look, if you got to wear a mask, make it fun. Wear one of our masks. And if if I hear anybody bitching about masks, I don't want anything to do with you. It's it it's a pain in the ass, but it's necessary. And I think he's made the right call. Um, my dad died nine months ago from issues related to COVID. You know, I'm sure we all know people who have died from COVID. It's not a joke. Also, last thing I'll say about COVID right now is I'm not one for doom scrolling or fear mongering, but I do know legit if you're 50 or over, 
I'm sure we've all had our shots, okay, uh, vaccines. But if you're 50 or over and you've had not had a vaccine shot in 2022, you should get one. Um, so, you know, Google that if you want. But I've I've done some research on that. It's it's a good thing to do. Neil is being like a mother hen. You know, he yes. wants everybody safe. He wants this thing to be a good time where people get together. After so many years of being cooped up, we finally get to sit down. And he doesn't want anyone to have a serious illness because of this convention. It's very hard to argue with his position. Yeah, and look, half the things we do at a convention, Pete, are, we, hey, you want to go at the bar and, and talk? Yeah, and then 10 other people join us. You know what? If you want to All take right. your mask off at the bar, Niels has no say over that. You know, don't spit in my face or anything, but I'm not going to yell at you if you take off your mask at the bar. But I, so, I think that while you're under Neil's purview, while you're at the convention, follow the directions and please try to do it without bitch. And Neil's works his ass off to make this fun for us. So I will tell you my story tell of how I got COVID back in July. Don't look at the clock. <laughs> we have plenty of time. All right. So many, many years ago, like 20... I feel like I'm watching Dr. Doofenshmirtz with his backstory. Backstory? Let 20... me tell you, Perry the Platypus. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years ago, I was a member of the Carefree Players who, per, who every Saturday night put on Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I did it for more than five years. Pete... Are what? you patient zero for COVID? No. Is that where you're going with this? No. All right. All right. Back in, I would say, June, one of our fellow members, cast members died. Okay. And Sorry we decided that we would do a tribute to a tribute show to him. So the old cast got together, about 20 of us, and we got a theater and we put on Rocky Horror Picture Show. And as I was getting dressed and heading out, I turned to my wife and I said, this is where I'm going to get COVID. Because 20 people in a 10 by 10 room changing clothes mm -hmm. and 200 people screaming at the top of their lungs in a theater is the way you get COVID. On that note, and I so, know this is going to disappoint some people. Pete and I will not be autographing body parts at this convention. Well, yeah, I know. It depends on the fair, person. You're not going to be autographing attached body parts. Yeah. Yeah. It's a... Case by case, know, right? Case by case. That's a case by case <laughs> basis. If it's bigger than a... If it's bigger than a, a hot dog, I might autograph it. Jesus. <laughs> all right so all right. uh programming schedule yeah i don't want to beat a dead horse but let's hit some highlights okay first of all um guys if you didn't see my email uh or my post to, to the patreons or whatever uh neils has scheduled us for a live lovecraft easing podcast Friday at 12.30. Friday at 12.30. Now what you can do is you go to Necronomicon-Providence and then at the top you click on Core Programming and it gives you everything. Scroll down. It's in chronological order. Friday uh, uh, being the first day, of course. All right, so Friday at 12.30. If you want to write this down without going to the website, it's at the, I'm going to mangle this word, Narragansett Bay Room, mm -hmm. N A R R A G A N S E T T, Narragansett Bay Room Graduate Hotel, seventeenth floor. That's twelve thirty Friday. Um. So, um, not that all our podcasts aren't live, but this is before live studio audience. Lovecraft Easing Podcast was not broadcast before a live studio <laughs> audience. In case anybody has trouble remembering the name of the ballroom, it's mm -hmm. where the uh, Shining Trap Pedazoid was thrown in, in the conclusion of the point of the book. Oh, 
Well, that's apropos. Um, all right, for those who don't know, not been there before, don't worry about doing everything. Matt's, Matt talks about this every year, and he's right. You're, for everything you do, you're going to miss three or four other things. That's that's not the point. The point is that you've got choices, and that there's always something fun to do. Um, so a beginner's... Is, if we're going to be doing a live podcast at 1230, uh, just to clear up, are, are you providing lunch then? Good one. That's a good one. Oh, oh, you're not. You're just, I'm going on a diet here, I guess. Uh, I will be handing out a bag, a small bag of peanuts to everyone that's on the panel and half a glass of stale water. Wait, so. that's our payment for the year, though. That's true. Um, yeah, that's at 1230 on Friday. Okay, so before that, a Beginner's Guide to New Weird Fiction, Biltmore Ballroom Graduate Hotel. Uh, that is at 11 a.m. Uh, there's several things going on at 11 a.m. Pete, if you want to, guys, if you want to pull this up too and catch anything that I'm not catching, I don't want to. No need. I'm for just me trying to, to make sure that. that my my panel requirements don't conflict with your live easing chat. It better not. I'm still waiting on the call to be on a panel. I'm still waiting on the call to be on a panel. I think Niels knew I didn't want to be on panels this year. Um, all right, here's something interesting. Friday at 2, Dr. Rachel Klima, John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, probing the Stygian. Don't you like that word? Yeah, you, we sh you use that word as often as you can, Stygian. Probing the Stygian depths of an alien ocean, could Europa support life? Jokes aside, I'm really interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, beneath the frozen scarred plains of Jupiter's moon Europa lies a vast ocean twice the size of all of Earth's oceans combined. And if that doesn't make your heart beat a little faster and trepidation, you know, geez. Um, that, I just think that kind of thing is really interesting. But what, wait, what's, is it an ocean of methane? No, it's, it's water. It's water. Water, really, and it's, it's liquid water. Mm -hmm. Well... Okay, that's interesting. And there was a movie, the Europa. Yep. Yeah, oh, I remember the Did you not see the movie? Yeah, I did. Okay. Well, I think it's frozen at the top, isn't it? Yeah. I, I believe it the, the liquid is it's kept liquid by um gravity. Uh your uh Jupiter's gravitational pool. Yeah. Oh, yes. it's constantly perturbing the core of the planet. Yeah. Or well, the moon, I mean. And its radiation is bombarding the crust too. Um, yeah. Okay. Though deadly at the surface, surface the energy may produce the ingredients needed to support life in the dark oceans beneath. I mean, Christ on a stick. If there's, <laughs> if there are Lovecraftian creatures somewhere in the solar system, that's where they are. Okay. <laughs> uh, under conditions of absolute reality, Shirley Jackson's life and legacy. Looks like at the same time. Uh, you guys have this page up? Got to, got to pick one. Do, yeah. I, do I have to do everything? I'm working here. Friday at 3.30. Um, we've got, oh, listen to this. But Stranger Still is Las Carcosa. Capital Ballroom Graduate Hotel. Now, if you're listening to this and you missed, hey, where does, where's Mike reading all this stuff from? Go to necronomicon-providence.com. Click on core programming at the top and just scroll down. It's all in chronological order. On the shores of Lake Holly in the star cluster Hades, sorry, stands Hades. the doomed city of Carcosa. Um, Carcosa is a mysterious and dread location. Our panelists discuss rep representations of the city and its inhabitants in different works and how the mythology of Carcosa developed and expanded over time. Um, Pete Rollick, will it be on that panel? Yes, I will. That's as, what I was checking. As as well as other people. Um, Ken Height, James Chambers, Curtis Lawson, Oscar Rios. Um, it's 7 o'clock. It's 7 o'clock. Thank you, Pete. Um, of course, we all know at least one person who now lives in Carcosa. So, and uh, I know we miss him. 
Let's see. Arthur, author readings, not Arthur, author. Friday at 5. The art, and, the art of Weird and Horror Comics. That's cool. Yeah. Um, the Ecology of Myth, Mythos Monsters. Surprised you're not on that one, Pete. Um, yeah, so so Fred is Lube now is, is representing our Oh Fred, yeah, he's yeah, he's good. Yeah. Um, but I, you know what? I'm gonna go to that panel. Yeah. And you know, I'll probably get you know, I'll probably do my my best not to stay quiet. Friday at six thirty, what music tells us weird music is narrative. Bridget should be on that panel, but She's yeah, fairly I, new to the scene. Niels may not yes. know about her. Um, it, when her book comes out, she's go, you know when the book comes out, she's going to have the bona fides to say I should be on these panels. I thought about saying something to Niels, but he's busy enough. You know, he doesn't need my. To doesn't be honest, need my she bullshit. might not want to be on a panel her first convention here. I haven't asked I've her. But thought about that too. She and Mike are coming, and they, I think they just want to enjoy the scene because they're moving across the country right now. Yep. Actually, Bridget and Mike will be here um, in my town this uh, this Thursday, the 4th. You're going to have lunch with me. That's so cute. It, You know what? It is cute, Pete Raleigh. <laughs> it is. I think it's very cute. I'm not going to say I offered them to like drive through the middle of the country and stay here, and they decided to go visit you instead. I, I wouldn't mention that at all. All right. Don't mention it. I won't. All right. Um, it's not that they like me better. It's exactly. It's something else that I can't think of. I think they're sucking up to the boss. <laughs> well, it's the route, isn't it? They're going. They're I, I think it's more or less, it's their route. Yeah, they're going to Virginia, <laughs> right? That's like they're least... also going to Waco for some reason, and Waco is like sixty minutes from here. So, anyway. Friday at 7, guest reception. Uh, private reception for guests of honor, guests, and golden key holders. You know who you are. Orders provided, cash bar available. The reception. I, I say yes. that, that, um, usually on Thursday night after the opening ceremonies, about 7 p.m., they have something called the Black Lodge Party, which is for uh, VIP guests, et cetera. But it got canceled this year because of venue concerns the black lodge you mean like twin peaks black lodge yes yeah, it, yeah. It, it used to be just it was like really just a place to go have a beer oh yeah i remember people but it it uh, had to be shut down they are still having the grand ball but they had to shut down the black lodge party all right so this is a private reception for guests of honor the guests and golden key holders which is like the big ticket if you bought one of those i think they're gone now Hors d'oeuvres provided, cash bar available. The reception will feature the presentation of the new Paul Joe Pulver Award called The Beastie. Oh, um, hey, this is cool. Great. Yeah. I didn't know about that. I don't, know, I don't know what the criteria is, and I don't know who the winner is, but I'm, I'm loving this. And, man, I can just imagine Joe's reaction if he knew that an uh, award's going to be, that an award is named after him. Now, he would just lose it. He'd love it. He'd be leaking tears like a summer thunderstorm, man. He deserves it. He deserves it. Uh, also, the presentation of the Robert Block Award. All right. Uh, Saturday, what have we lost? A great deal of weird fiction was considered disposable at the time of publication. Um, so they'll talk about that. I thought Clive Barker was going to be there for a second. Uh, okay, it looks like Paul is going to be uh, on a Clive Barker panel about Clive Barker with Larissa Glasser, Adam Glasky, and Douglas E. Winter. Now, here's one I want to go to. The Jewish Tradition in Weird Fiction, Capital Ballroom Graduate Hotel. This is, again, at 9.30 on Saturday. Um... You know, we're starting to see more and more Jewish horror, and, and I think it's fascinating as hell. Uh, we had Ed Erdeldeck on the show a few weeks ago. Um, he's going to be on that else? panel. Pardon me? Uh, who else we had previously? Josh Schlossberg. 
Josh Lashburn. Yeah, yeah, if he was going to be there, I don't know if he's going to be at the in the Economic Con, but if he was, I assume he'd be on that panel. So, Daniel Brom, Richard Gerlach, Nicholas Kaufman, and Ann Vandermeer is going to be on that panel. Uh, the Weird in Podcast form. This is pretty interesting. We have had a couple of weird fiction, several at least, weird fiction podcasts in the last several years. So that'll be interesting. Saturday at 11 now. Cosmic horror in films that does not draw on the work of HPL. Um, I don't want to read everything here, but Saturday at 2.15, they're going to talk. Past, oh, here's one that I want to go to. Again, Pete Rollick is going to be on this panel. Pastiche is not a dirty word. Writing from existing material. Omni Hotel 2. Again, if you're writing, if you're listening and you're writing stuff down, this is Saturday at 2 um, in the uh, Omni Hotel. I assume by 2 they mean room 2 or I don't know what they mean. Uh, classic weird fictions writers often borrowed from their forerunners and freely shared ideas and monsters with friends. The modern weird age has benefited from an, benefited from an interest in authors such as Lovecraft and Chambers as a boom in pastiche writing accompanied works entering the public domain. Why does it sometimes get a bad rap? Why do you, how do you stay true to existing material while staying original? What is the attraction to writing in someone else's sandbox? James Chambers, John Goodrich, Peter Rollick, our friend Douglas Wynn. Now, um, I said it a million times, I'll say it again. There's a lot of bad pastiche. But pastiche is not a dirty word. I mean, our friend Peter Rollick here writes amazingly great pastiche. So just because something's pastiche doesn't mean it's bad. But, okay, so wait. No, I don't... No. I don't really view Pete's writing as pastiche. I, pastiche I guess meaning he's definition. playing an HBO sandbox, like with HBO's oh, that, characters. Uh, no, no. I, I view pastiche as essentially, I guess I viewed it as essentially rewriting the story or very writing something very similar to the original story using the same tropes and stuff. I, you know, Matt, you've got more experience with this, but, and I, I'd like Pete and Rick's opinion, but I would respectfully disagree with you on that i i think that's that is pastiche that's the bad pastiche and then the good bass pastiche is 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 playing in hbl's sandbox uh, pete what do you think am i wrong yes i think that <laughs> yes <laughs> no God damn it. i don't the problem is that you through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, pastiche was not, was an okay thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And then suddenly in the 80s, it became a dirty word. And, you know, I, I think that you what we saw was the, the new tales of the Cthulhu mythos, which showed that you could write mythos fiction without pastiching Lovecraft. And then everybody just wanted to to, and to dead do but dreaming. And dead but dreaming, you know, and Laird Barron and you know John Langan, Paul Tremblay, you know, you can do it without aping Lovecraft. And so we tried to get a what you know, people just oh well, that's just a Lovecraftian pastiche. I, well, I thought that you would just label that as cosmic horror. Right. In, but and in, if it's HPL related, then you would label that as Lovecraftian slash pastiche. What I think we need to do better okay. is that we need to come up with more terminology, better yes. terminology. Yeah. You know, we have this great thing called cosmicism, and then we have cosmic horror and absurd cosmic absurdism. And then you can start whittling it down to uh, eventually something that's called Lovecraft and something that's called Cthulhu Mythos. And I love when people say, Oh, Herbert West is so Lovecraftian. I'm like, no, Herbert West is not Lovecraftian. <laughs> There's nothing Lovecraftian about Herbert West. It's Except that it was written by by H.P. Lovecraft. He's like, oh, everything that H.P. Lovecraft wrote is Lovecraftian. No, absolutely not. 
No, I got a copy. Not in the sense that we mean it. And his menu, and that's a Lovecraftian menu. Yeah. What menu? Sorry. His menu for the week, what he would eat for a week. He lived on two dollars and ten cents a day. Right. Yeah. So not everything, but not so. And I think Lovecraftian pastiche falls into that someplace, and unfortunately, it has become a dirty word, and it shouldn't. And I hope this panel goes a long way to to show that. Do do you write pastiche in your view? Yes, I wrote I write pastiche, and Matt has called me out on it. It's like when Matt was editing anthologies, he's like, "You sent me the exact story I thought you would send me. You sent me this." a play off of one or two lines of, of a Lovecraft story and you took characters that Lovecraft mentioned in passing and you gave them their own life and their own storyline and that's your pastiche. And I don't have any problem with that. But that's good that's, pastiche. That's not that's rewriting like a story. But you know, Derelith wrote some really bad pastiche and um, what I think the worst part of Derelith was that he wrote pastiche of himself. Sometimes he wrote yeah. the same story. And now, I... Man's got to eat. That, what's that? Man's got to eat. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and I know that there are examples where, you know, Robert E. Howard and Clark Ashton Smith cannibalized their own stories. They went back and they, they grabbed themes and, and ideas and, and, and scenes. Now, if, you re, if you go through Rossini's... You know, he used to, Rossini, the composer, used to say... If you give me a laundry list, I can write an opera about it. Right. He recycled overtures. He recycled melodies. He recycled arias because he was a working stiff, just cranking them out for the theater. Well, yes. da- Danny Elfman, and yet you can tell a Danny Elfman piece without anyone telling you really if you're halfway musically inclined. But they're all in some way different too. There are yes. certain things that he likes to do, certain intru- instruments that he likes. But, you know, Edward Scissorhands' soundtrack is brilliant, and so is Batman 89 and Batman Returns, you know? So, yeah, we've been dying to say Batman 89 tonight, haven't Batman, you? I've already said, I already said Batman 89. I know. See, now if you're a patron, no, it's a segue. Well, Rick, what do you think? Well... As he mentioned Durlis, he's in the rather unique position of writing the best pastiche and the worst pastiche. <laughs> best was a series called Solar Parts. Yes. The best Sherlock Holmes pastiche I've ever read. Because he took a guy, rather than write about Sherlock Holmes, he wrote about a detective who imitated Sherlock Holmes. And all the tropes are there, but they're set in the 20s and 30s, which is different. And he has good mysteries. What do you have, Pete? But then he did the Cthulhu Mythos stuff, which is this repetitive. Not so much the plots were bad. The problem was they had the same framing device. I get tired of guys buying houses in Arkham and Innsmouth. <laughs> They're the first seven Solar Ponds books. Some realtor is doing well in Arkham, I'll tell you. Yeah, no, you know, and and uh, Rick makes a good point is that you know the, the I inherited a house and it happened to be you know tied in the mythos. Um, it makes Arkham you know a hell mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, and whether that's the seal of rely or the whippoorwills in the hills or how many ghost stories start that way too you know? yeah yeah pretty yeah. common uh yes i've been dying to say batman 89 p i'll go back to necronomicon in a moment but oh no for a commercial break um listen sam ham who wrote batman 89 the movie is going to be on a Patreon podcast next month, um, along with perhaps the illustrator of the Batman 89 um, comic series of Ooh. the recent past. So he's he 
want to know if you could bring him? I'm like, hell yeah, you can. Hell yeah, you can bring him. So this is an example of the really neat stuff. You don't get the cast off stuff. You get some really neat stuff as a Patreon. Um, you know, five dollars a month is is the bottom pledge, and you get every single Patreon podcast with that. Okay, you get some really neat things at higher levels, but let's forget about those from now. Um, Sam Ham will be on next month in a Patreon podcast. Um, let's see, uh, past Patreon podcasts. There's some been some damn cool ones. The first one that comes to mind, obviously, is is well, Paul Trimbley, Nadia Wilkin, and I talked about Lake Mungo. Uh, Laird Barron and I talked about his scary things creepy things that have happened in his life that are, that are true stories. And I listened to these in daylight and, you know, I got goosebumps. I mean, there's some really creepy stuff. And Laird, as we all know, is a great storyteller. Matt um, and I talked about book collecting. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really good one. I loved that one. I learned, I learned quite a bit. Uh, so they're really cool. Uh, they're all out there. And look, there are some of us, Five dollars a month. Um, Five dollars a month is not something that they can spare. Some people can spare, you know. Um, f- Five dollars, you know, makes a, makes a difference in your finances. There are some people like that, and I I get that. So this is a no pressure little side chat here. But my wife's a school teacher. School teacher salary. This is the only income I have. Um, and, you know, I, $5 a month, just, you know, $5 for every 30 days or so, I'm not going to miss it. And I'm kind of low on the financial spectrum. So if you're like me, if you're like most of us, um, please consider that, that you're not really going to miss it and that you can stop uh, the Patreon pledge anytime you want. You know, you're not signing up for a year or anything like that. So, and you're going to get a lot from it. Um, you really are. Besides that, I'll I'll hand out just different odds and ends and special things to Patreons. Um, so, please consider it. Just go to patreon.com slash Lovecraft Easing or just Google Lovecraft Easing Patreon, easy I and E. All right, the other thing I want to talk about before we go back to Necronomicon is the Lovecraft Easing podcast has a phone number now. Uh, you can leave us a message. Uh, with a comment or a question about the podcast, or let's say you've got a, I don't know, a Lovecraftian question for these three guys who are experts, Rick, Matt, Pete, um, and, you know, you want to, you want their opinion on something, uh, anything related, or you have a suggestion for a future podcast, or got podcast guest, or you just want to tell us that you enjoy listening to us babble on every Sunday. Uh, whatever you want to do, um, it'll go straight to voicemail. It's I've I've included it in the show notes, but it's five one five six five zero twenty five forty five one five six five zero twenty five forty. And I just know that Matthew Carpenter is going to leave me a message in a disguised voice and ask me something weird. So, and I I may read your comment. I may play your comment or question on the air. So bear that in mind. So, if so you want to, if you want to tell Matt, like Matt, Matt Carpenter, just what you think of him, there's the number. So, anyway, I think it's a cool thing to do. And besides, I got a, I got, <laughs> I got chronic pain. I can only answer so many emails. <laughs> so, anyway, that's the number six five one five six five zero twenty five forty. We now return to your show in progress. Um. Hey, Mike. Yes. So this just got announced by James Louder, available now in ebook from Chaosium and in print this October. Lees of the Necronomicon. What? Oh, totally. Yep. Who, who's publishing this again? Chaosium. Ooh, they're sending me a book. So I need that. The, I need that uh, whiteboard right here. This is this is why I have a whiteboard right here. Okay. Introduction by by Joe Pulver. 
Nate Pedersen, Don Tyson, Allison Berg, Daniel Mills, Nick Mamatas, S.P. Miskowski, Cody Goodfellow, Robert Price, Don Webb, Anna Tambor, Mike Allen, John Claude Smith, Catherine Tobler, P- P- Amy P- and Angelica Walters. When is this going to? When is it going to be available? And is it available for pre-order now? It's available in ebook right now. Shit. And print this October. How much ebook? I don't know. Okay. Hold on. Um, this this was website. Joe had 8, a lot of 8:49. Okay, Joe had a lot of dream projects, but this was really a dream project of Joe's. I, I I've told you guys many times that just during the day when we would work, Joe would have Joe and I would have on, you know, uh, be videoing each other just. Sometimes we'd talk, sometimes we'd work, just like we were in the same room, you know, working in the same office. It was, it was fun. Uh, I'm sharing this to the Easing community. Thank you. And he was one of my, he was one of my best friends. Uh, Pete, can you email me that real quick? Cause I want to put it on the, on the, um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. I just, I just sent it to the Easing community. Um, share. Hang on. I'll just go there. I want to share it with the, um, on the chat here. Um, for people what's your name mike davis i see it. It don't be, worry about it pete is it going to be hardcover or i doubt it i i'm actually shocked chaosium stays open but that's just me i i actually envision this as a um as a uh either ps publishing or more likely hippocampus uh kind of thing but hey it's it's out there that's great yeah, uh, Joe. Anyway, my point is that at least once a week, Joe would be talking about leaves in the Economicon. To yeah, me. I, you know, he tried. We tried to. I came in on the tail end of this. Yeah, he had already set up everything when he and I first met, and you know, we we tried to work something in, and we just couldn't. You know, then he got really sick. Yeah. So anyway. Let's, All right. Let's. I'm not going to deep beat a dead horse, but there's a lot of really cool things at Necronomicon. Yeah. Um, Can we talk about the author lists? Well, actually, uh, yes. we also talk about some of the extended programming. No. No. Yes. Well, we can't talk about authors either. Then. Well, what? Okay. What do you want to talk about, Matt? Well, just you know, the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society does this wonderful. Hang on. Uh, Hang arc- on. So what we didn't get to in the core program, go to Necronomicon-Providence.com. Click on core programming. You can get the rest. Go ahead, Matt. If you love a uh, good Lovecraftian radio play, you're probably already a fan of Dark Adventures Radio Theater. Absolutely. The vehicle for uh, the um, HP Lovecraft Historical Society. They always do a couple performances. They are doing no less than three performances. Oh man! One is on Friday night. Is the horror in the museum on Sunday night? Uh, is the Curse of Yig. And what is really exciting is they've got a special brand new presentation on Saturday night, uh, something never heard before. You could be one of the first, uh, which is Purgatory Chasm. I I think it is an original uh, and it's supposed to be interactive where the audience gets to make decisions to help it go along. Oh man. Uh, I really wish I could go to those. Um, it's at eight o'clock at night. If if you're you're okay, I mean. Oh no, but, I'll I'll be okay. I can't go because I'm a half deaf. In any kind of uh, situation like that, I can hear that they're talking, but it just turns into a. They, they sound kind of like a raw raw. I can't understand what they're saying. Uh well, uh, the other thing, if, you, if you're interested in this kind of thing, the Eldritch Ball is Saturday at midnight. I, uh, I'm sorry, at 9 p.m. to midnight. And that's where you can, it's the theme is the Mask of the Red Desk. You're, death, you're supposed to go in costume or semi-formal attire. They usually have great music, great decor. Are you going uh, to that? I, I've been to a couple, but, you know, Isabel's not going, and I just end up sort of standing around watching other people dance, which is a blast, so I'm not going this year. As fun as that sounds. Right. All right. You want to talk about guests, Pete? Yes. So 
I'm looking at this guest list and I'm really, really happy. Okay. So Matt Bartlett, James Moore, who we've had on the show. Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. Will Murray, Michael Cisco, John Langan. Cisco. Langan. Yep. Jack Haringa, who is a literary critic. Mm-hmm. Scott Dwyer, L.C. Von Hessen, Ed Erdelak. Here's a blast from the past. Doug Winter. Douglas Winter. Mm-hmm. He was an um, uh, agent. I think he was Stephen King's first agent. Um, but he's also written books and edited anthologies. Paul Tremblay, um, Cassandra Call, ah. who is, I think, British. Yeah, she uh, was Bella Hammers on Bone. She's the one who yes. wrote the Blackened Teeth. Yep. I uh, can't remember the title quite, but. Nothing but Blackened Teeth. Yes. A Song for Quiet, Hammers on Bones. Uh, Doug Wynn, James Chamber, Nadia Bulkin. Leslie Klinger. Oh, Leslie's going to be there? Leslie's going to be there. Nice. Nicole Cushing, Ellen Chagonova Paulson, John Goodrich, Dan Harms, Kurt Komoda. Now, this is not, I made this mistake, so don't make this. It's not Paul Komoda, it's Kurt Komoda. Paul Komoda does these, does these, do these, does these really elaborate, almost fractal images of Cthulhu and, and whatnot. Kurt Komoda did the art for the Necro Nom 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 Nomicon. Oh yeah, and, he's great. And, and the bar book as well. And that is just as impressive. Um, Molly Tanzer, mm, Molly Jason does. Eckhart, the artist Jason Eckhart, um, Paul DeFilippo, Bob Otom, uh, who has a the, the triangle I blurbed, He's also in Call of Cthulhu. Did you um, say Nadia? And, is she going to be? Yes, I did say Nadia. Blake. Nadia as a guest? Yes. Oh, let me stop you right there. Nadia has put in a request for Necronomicon. She tweeted the other day, one of my mentors at work asked if a horror convention involves people jumping out, trying to scare you, and now I want that kind of horror convention, please. So I wrote, I'll try to accommodate that request at this year's Necronomicon. Um, you know that there are scare cons, right? Uh, I guess she didn't. Okay, so yeah, there are conventions for haunts that hap- that don't happen in October. They happen earlier in the year, so that ha- guys who put on haunts can, you know, gain information and trade ideas. So my point is, if you know, um, I would, I would, everyone listening to the sound of my voice, you should. Should, scare the hell out of Nadia Bolkin. Yes, but the way to do this, if you don't know her, is um, you know, Google Nadia Bolkin, then go to an image search so you know what she looks like, and then um, you know, a, 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 attempt to scare her anytime you see her at Necronomicon. Do and, you remember? And tell her Mike Davis. Still, yeah. thank you quite a lot, Mike. I'm sure. I'm sure she, hey, look, she threw down the challenge. She said she was going to scare me, so it's on. It's on. You know what I'm do saying? Do you remember the film festival where? Um, uh, one of the Tom uh, Thomas, which one? Jeff. Jeff Thomas couldn't make it. But we, <laughs> we all had print, his head. <laughs> they held. They printed out little pictures of him. And, yes. Everybody's so, holding up his head, like because yep. <laughs> he was so uh, upset that he couldn't make it. Yep. Uh, just three more: Daniel Brom, John Paget, and Curtis Lawson. John Paget, John's gonna be okay, John Paget, awesome. So, so people out there going, if you have a book by them that you want to get signed, they're all very approachable. Did, I, I you want to see H. Lovecraft's cat, cat book, and Jason Eckhart was very kind enough to draw a special picture in there for me, and he didn't sign it. So I'm gonna bring my <laughs> cat book for him to sign. Um, he, he's an artist inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, isn't he? Yeah. And he's I, guess, not, he, I don't think he was ever like formally trained. He's just been drawing forever. No. P- he P- knew the Michaudes and he was a big artist for uh, Necronomicon Press. Yep. And uh, now he's still at it, illustrating books. Um, he was the one who illustrated the really wonderful hardcover Curse of Yig. Jason sorry, is a nice guy. We had him on once. Uh, fun guy from Yugoth. Uh, 
hardcover edition from Hippocampus. Now, Matt's right. The, the writers are very approachable mm-hmm. and the artists. Pete Rollick is very approachable. However, he does charge for autographs. Yep. I need a, just a little bit of your blood. Yeah. <laughs> so. so one, one other thing. Okay. No, Sunday we got a couple night, of other if things. If you're still there, this is something that has only happened a couple times. They're having the Dunwich Horror Picture Show, sure. which is they show that 1970s uh, Dunwich Horror movie, which is just Sandra D. I know it's not great. It sucks. Uh, you no one, take that back, Pete. But, I, Pete, I know you're going to be at this, but. They have people go up on stage, just like Rocky Horror, and act the movie out while it's happening. Pete, are you going to be there? Um, it depends. Oh, no, 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 no. No, it, no. it depends. It depends, because I think we're flying. Let me tell you. It depends happened. on if you and I are in a bar drinking. <laughs> yeah. Um, that would be like on the... <laughs> the tw- okay, my flight on the 22nd is at 7 o'clock. It isn't anywhere near the 22nd. What? It's 7 o'clock Sunday in the night. morning? Yeah, 7 o'clock in the morning. Isn't that Monday, the 22nd? Yeah. Or uh, Tuesday, I meant. No, Monday's the 22nd. Monday? So let me get this straight. You've never stayed up late and gotten drunk when you had to get up early before. I am an old man. You've, you're, you you're still do baby. it. I know. No, I'm gonna. I knew I'm gonna need you there. I'm gonna need film. So I'm not I'm getting need, naked. No need video. I did not request that, and I do not want. Although that. Although someone pretty much did at the uh, 2016 screening of the Dunwich Horror Picture Show in San Pedro, California. <laughs> well, it depends on who they are. Um. Anyway, I've got a, I've got two Xerox boxes worth of books, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna get signed. Speaking of getting signed on my TBR on the show notes, I also have a book titled The Eldritch Equations by Pete Rollick. Now, is that out now, Pete? Uh, I believe it's available for pre-order. All right. Um, I linked linked to it in the show notes. And um, get yourself one right away And if you're going to Necronomicon, and then Pete will... Uh, sign it for you at Necronomicon. I am. I'm going to bring fifty copies. Okay. So, um, I'm going to sell those all in a day or two. Will you sign mine, or will you just flip me off and tell me to get lost? I will loser. sign you. Get, get lost, loser. Uh, that, the that dreams exactly in the what... witch house were just the beginning. That's the the lead on this uh, this book. Anyway, I can't wait to read it. So here, I thought you read it. Didn't you blurb it? No. Oh, shit. I fucked up. What? Did you take um, my blurb for another book and put it in there? Probably. <laughs> uh- <laughs> I'm Look, here's my blurb. I'm sure it's great. I haven't read it yet, but I'm sure it's great. <laughs> so here's how this book came about. I wanted to write a sequel... To There's no Randy. blurb by Mike Davis in this. What are you talking about? I don't know. Everything just runs together now. All right. Go on. Anyway, Jesus. so I was at the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival and I saw the rock opera for Dreams in the Witch House. It's great. It is awesome. Oh, they sent me the LP for that. It's awesome. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, and there's a line in that where uh, Gilman is up at the at the blackboard, and there's there's a refrain. There's a bridge to the stars, and like the whole chorus joins in, and like that's the story. It's not. It's a sequel to the Dreams in the Witch House because everybody in that classroom saw that equation. And that equation is a bridge to the stars. Now, I know you said you don't know what's going on, but will there be, there's a question on the live chat, will there be a Kindle version of the Eldritch Equations? 
I'm pretty sure there'll be a Kindle version. Um, I also know so that people want know. an audio. What's that? So you don't know? Probably not. I, I, there's no audio. I'm sorry. There will probably be a Kindle version. Yes, we can't get around that. But I doubt that there will be an audio version. It's just be, it had become too expensive. Oh, it is expensive. And if, if you could make the money back, that would be one thing. But you it's, don't always. And people complain, oh, why is there not an audio version? Well, I listen to audiobooks all the time. I love them. Right. And when I see a book that I want and I want to continue listening to it when I go to bed and I look, spend my credit on that and there's no audio version, I'm like, damn it. But I also understand, you know, being a small press publisher myself, and by small, I mean small, small. I, I did one. It was very expensive. Probably just now making my money back on the Sea of Ash after five years. Yeah. And it's a brilliant audio. Um, Lehman Kessler did did it um scott thomas was very happy with it i was actually amazed at the talent of lehman kessler doing the three doing different voices for the three protagonists when i asked him to do it i had i didn't even think about that but each protagonist had to be quite distinctive yeah you know yeah and i have in for um object equations it's told from three different points of view yeah. so yeah well first of all if you've not read the sea of ash look yeah scott and i do get a little bit of money if you buy it but the point is it is just a really great book and if you have read it maybe spend the credit on on the audio version and listen to it um i even wrote some lead in and lead out music for it nothing fancy but just to set the mood so um anyway a few more things um, Necronomicon dinner for patrons. Yeah, what night do you want to do that? You want to do it Sunday? Why am I in charge? Well, no, we we'll just we have to decide. Oh, you're asking me? My, okay. Well, I don't know. Is anything going on Saturday night? Well, the um, the one uh, the Eldritch Ball is Saturday night. And the performance of uh, that special performance, I think that's at eight p.m. Maybe we yeah. should maybe we should do a Patreon lunch. Well, we could do like a six to seven thirty dinner on Sunday. But some people will be gone by then. That's okay. Because the, no, I don't know if it is because some Patreons they'll they'll want to be there, but they have to leave to get back to work on Monday. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to figure, I also have to do bar trivia in here somewhere. What? When? I, they don't, I, I don't know yet. Okay, listen, let's, let's do this. They, they, they've got you listed already, Pete. When? Uh, on extended programming, let's see, it's like. You can't be bothered to look at that. No, times. I didn't. I, There's trivia hour, 9.30 to 10.30 p.m., and that's on Saturday night. And where is that? Uh, location TBD, but it's open to the public. Okay. All right. So that's Saturday night at nine thirty. Saturday. Yes, night. I'm thinking like Saturday if the uh, ball is at nine and Dark Adventure Radio Theater is at eight, we could have like, of I don't know, a five thirty to seven thirty Patreon dinner on uh, Saturday. Okay. Saturday. Okay. Let me put that on my. Saturday five thirty. Five. To seven thirty. To seven. All right. The, the cool thing is we won't announce the location or anything. To no, I think it's going to be at one of the Irish pubs. <laughs> Well, now it's I don't know. Case. I got to figure it out. It's either going to be at the the hotel restaurant or one of the Irish pubs. Now, when and I I'm say patron need... dinner, I mean if you're giving me a dollar a month or a hundred dollars a month, whatever. Um, nobody's giving me a hundred dollars a month, but uh, but you can if you want to. Um, you're all invited. I wish that I could pay for everybody's dinner, but it's just it's just a dinner of. You know, it's Dutch, and um, let's just all get together, and I just want to tell you guys how much I appreciate you, that sort of thing. Last time I was there uh, is burned, last Patreon dinner we did, it was the first one, this will be the second one, it is burned into my memory. Uh, were you there, Matt? I don't remember, sorry. I don't think you were. It was is that the one we did at the, the hotel restaurant, which was... Um, it's the only one we've ever done. Schmicks. Yeah, I've I only been there. doing the Patreon like two, three or four years at most. Matt was there. I was there. 
Yeah. Yes. I was able to get broken thing there. Yes, that's right. Um, Pete said some really nice things about me that I was immediately on the phone with my wife about, and I just. Uh, did you cry? I did, and I'm trying okay. not to right now. To be honest, seriously. I, I thought was, that was when he stuck you with the bill. It meant a lot to me. Yeah, I cried when he stuck me with the bill too. No. But that, that's a, that was a, that was those were different tears. So one. No, was I one, remember. So I one okay, was so happy this, tears and one was sad tears. No, so here's actually what happened: is I paid for everybody. Yeah, he's a very nice guy. I had a relationship with the restaurant, and for every hundred dollars spent, I got ten dollars in cash. Nice. So I ate all so, my meals for free that weekend. So your meal may or may not be paid this year. We, you just don't know. You just have to show up and find out. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I, but I remember Pete's talking. You know, he's giving a speech and everything. And so he's, you know, everybody, you know, raise your glass. And I raise my glass. And he's like, put your glass down. I'm like, what the hell did I do? Um, <laughs> remember that? <laughs> yeah. Because we were toasting you, moron. <laughs> I know, but I didn't see it coming. I thought you were just toasting all of us, you know? So, but thank you. No, it's burned into my memory. I really appreciate it. All right. So uh, what I'll do is I'll figure out some place that can host, what, 20 people? That's, that's a really rough everything. guess, but yeah. Because okay. there's going to be most of the people from the panel will probably, who are going, like, there yeah. will be... Uh, Rick, yeah, the panel is going to. Yeah. Uh, the Bren, uh, the Bren marks, you know. All right. I would say at least, yeah. No, I I can't, you know, you can't reserve at least. Uh, right, okay. So I'll, I'll put 20 people in and we'll have to limit it. I don't know. I don't know. Can you say 25? I can say 25, but, you know, I'm going to have to talk to a restaurant. And, the you know, the more, the bigger it gets, the fewer our choices are. I'm like, at 20 people, I still, I'm pretty sure I can't do that to a pub. Saturday? Yeah. Well, look, we can always pull up another chair, right? Yeah. But ultimately, I think what's going to end up doing is we're going to use the hotel restaurant because they, I, do, I know they do have a little back room they could put us in. All right. Look, if you're a patron, you're listening to this, or if I've talked to you into becoming a patron, um, email me as soon as possible uh, to let me know that you're going to be at Necronomicon and you'd like to come to the Patreon dinner. Lovecrafteasing at gmail.com gmail.com lovecrafteasyne at gmail.com Alternatively, you can leave a message at the phone number if you really want. <laughs> um, hey, I've already gotten a message on this. Mike, I'm 71 and I usually try to catch your show Sunday afternoons on YouTube. I've come to look at you, Rick, Pete, Matt, and the others as buddies. That's what that's one of the best compliments that I think our show gets. That that's what I want this to be. Um, hope you're having a good, good summer. Uh, do I have to read this next part? Oh no. yeah, I really enjoy it when John Langan shows up. Be well. And German Godzilla. Be well, Ed. Thank thank you, Ed. I really appreciate it. Um, I do have a couple of other things. Uh, any moment my kids are going to come home and I'm going to have to leave. Well, I'm about to leave too. Um, but I just want to make sure I covered everything that I wanted to cover. We covered the Necronomicon dinner. Um, da, da, da. Oh, I think we'd be remiss in closing without mentioning that Nichelle Nichols died. Yes. Was that today? Or uh, it was yesterday, but yeah. I think it was announced today. Yeah. Yeah. So what... What you may not know, maybe you do, is that in the 60s, um, during the show, Nichelle Nichols, um, you know, she was used to, I think, musicals and the stage. She had a beautiful singing voice. Yeah. Uh, so she decided that, look, she just can't continue with this, this little show. Um, and she gave Gene Roddenberry her... Um, um, sorry, she said she's going to her resignation. Uh, here's a, here I'm reading from the article. This is a quote from the show Nichols. He Gene took at it, took it, and looked at it with sad eyes. 
He was behind his desk, and I was standing in front of him, and I'll never forget it. He said, I'm not going to accept this yet. He put it in his desk drawer, and he said, take the weekend and think about this, Nichelle. If you still want to do this on Monday morning, I will let you go with my blessings. I said, thank you, Gene, and I thought, phew, that was rough, but I got through it. Um, he told her before, he goes, you can't quit, Nichelle. Don't you see what I'm trying to do here? Um, obviously meaning, um, you know, an African-American woman in a major show um, and, uh, you know, representation. And he was he, it was good what he was trying to do, especially in the 60s. Then she went to an NAACP fundraiser or something similar. Um, and one of the organizers of the event came over and said to me, Miss Nichols, I hate to bother you just as you're sitting down to dinner. But there's someone here who very much, very much wants to meet you, and he said to tell you that he's your biggest fan. Michelle Nichols said, oh, certainly, not knowing who it was. This tells you what kind of person she is. was. I stood up and turned around, and who comes walking over me from about 10 to 15 feet, smiling that rare smile of his, is Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I remember saying to myself, whoever that fan is, whoever the Trekkie is, they'll have to wait, because I have to meet Mr. Dar not Mr. Do Dr. Martin Luther King. And he walks up to me and says, yes, Miss Nichols, I am your greatest fan. Uh, you know I can talk, but all my mouth could do was open and close, open and close. I was so stunned. Uh, he revealed to Nichols that uh, the original series was the only show that he and his wife, Coretta, allowed their little children to stay up and watch. He told her what the show meant to him personally and detailed the importance of her having a character, created a character with dignity and knowledge. Nichelle Nichols took it all in and said, thank you so much, Dr. King. I'm really going to miss my co-stars. Dr. King's smile, she recalled, vanished from his face. He said, what are you talking about? The actress said, I told him, he said, you can't. And so help me, this man practically repeated verbatim what Gene Rodberry said. He said, don't you see what this man is doing who's written this? This is the future. He has established us as we should be seen. 300 years from now, we are here. We are marching. And this is the first step. When we see you, we see ourselves, and we see ourselves as intelligent and beautiful and proud. And he goes on, and I'm looking at him, and my knees are buckling. I said, I, I, I. <laughs> and he said, you turn your television on, and the news comes on, and you see us marching in peaceful. You see the peaceful civil disobedience. You see the dogs and the firehouses and the fire hoses. And we all know that they cannot destroy us because we are there in the 23rd century. And I just thought that was beautiful. You know, on the one hand, oh, geez, it's just a TV show. On the other hand, you got something that millions of people are watching. And when you have, in the, it's the 60s, and you have a African-American female, no less, on the deck of the Starship Enterprise, you're really doing something important there. So, anyway, um... Rest in peace, Nichelle Nichols, and, you know, she really did blaze a trail. Uh, yeah. You wouldn't have had Captain Sisko if you didn't have Lieutenant Yahura. You know. I agree. Wouldn't have had a lot. Um, just briefly, I'm watching Yellow Jackets. I don't know if it's paranormal yet or not, but man, there's some freaky episodes. You guys know what Yellow Jackets is? Uh, it's a show. Um, I, I don't, don't give know me that about... smug look, man. You haven't watched it. I thought it was going to be stupid too. Oh, it's it's. I don't think it's going to be stupid. I no, I was looking at talking to Pete. <laughs> it's about a girls' soccer team that was really great, and they were in a plane crash, and some bad things happened. And now it's years later, and they're trying to reconcile what happened. Right. Uh, but I. I've read some reviews. I'm kind of interested, but it, I haven't watched it yet. Well, I've watched three episodes, and I have to say that I'm really enjoying what I'm seeing. It's it's really good. In one of them, in 2021, which is the pr present day, um, a little boy of one of the girls says, she goes, why did you put all this stuff on your, on your bedroom window? He goes, so the lady in the tree can't see me. She is in the tree at night and she watches me. That's that's pretty creepy. <laughs> so, last but not least, we will close up with a question. 
What is a Pete Rollick completist? I heard this phrase recently. I think it was one of your publishers, something like, if you are a Pete Rollick completist, then you will need to. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> Eldritch Equations is coming out in two editions. Right. It's going to be come out in what we call the silver screen edition, which is like a, a, a noir black and white. Um, I think that's a beautiful cover. And then eventually that's going to be phased out completely. And we're going to be left with this psychedelic, you know, purple and purple and purple cover. Um, And that's, that would be the the new weird. Yes. Purple and Um, pink together. It's purple and pink, but ultimately the silver, silver screen edition will be phased out. Um, And both covers are gorgeous. And, uh, you know, we couldn't figure out what to do. Um, we wanted to do sort of this limited edition, and then we wanted to go to a regular edition. So this is the compromise we came up with. And we thought we would just, you know, do the silver screen and then stop it and then go move on to the purple and pink one. But what we decided to do is release both of them at the same time. So if you're a mm-hmm. Pete Rollick completist, you yes. both of these. Yes. And I've got to come up with something snappy, like a two-parter signature line. Oh, that's a great idea. With one, one, like maybe a joke where the first part goes in one book and the second part goes in another. <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. The very last and possibly most important thing, probably most important thing, is the our indispensable and knowledgeable friend Rick Lay is up for an award. Right, Rick? Don't, don't jinx it. <laughs> I just want to give you the respect that you deserve. Don't jinx it. All right. You don't want to talk about it? No. All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You will, if you win it, will you tell us then? Uh, yes, yes. If I win it, that's a whole different thing. Okay. All right. Well, everybody send positive, non-jinxed thoughts towards Rick. I won't be here next week. Yeah, because you'll be there. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. Pete, Rick, Matt, thank you. Prize. Black and Endless Sky. If you want to win the copy, great book. Enter easy and prizes at gmail.com and put black in the subject heading. Great book. I need to talk, need to talk to Pete for one minute after we finish. Sure thing. Uh, right. Thanks, everybody, for, for listening and, and watching, and we will see you next week. Bye bye. Good night, guys.